from him there. Uh, we're joined in the studio by Gary Sandbrook, the Conservative MP for Birmingham Northfield, Stephen Kinnock, Shadow Minister for Immigration and the Labour MP for Aberavon, and Stuart Hosey, the Scottish National Party spokesperson on the economy and the SNP MP for Dundee East. Thank you all very much for joining us. Um, Gary, let, let's come to you first of all. Um, Shamim Mabagan, we've been talking about it just in the last few minutes. Do, do you think it's, it's the right decision? I think it's absolutely the right uh, decision. And I think the government made the right calls um, to begin with. We made sure that the government are doing what it was necessary to protect the UK. Uh, and I think the court has proven the government right today. Uh, what I think is concerning is that we've seen in the past, um, Sir Keir Starmer is on the record as saying well, what the government did was wrong. And that throws into question his judgment if he's ever in a position where he has to make the calls on the security of this country. Stephen Kinnock, I mean, it does seem pretty clear from, from the court today that they don't think that the Home Secretary did, did anything wrong with the evidence that was available to him at the time. National security has to be our first uh, priority. We, of course, have not been party to all the details of this case because it was in a closed court. But um, our justice system is second to none. And we, of course, fully respect uh, the decision of the court today. Um, it's it's difficult to comment further without the... Look, yeah, I mean, we are very clearly in a position where the court has looked at the facts of the case. Uh, to which we have not been party and has taken a decision accordingly. And clearly, if the court feels that Shemar Begum is still too much of a risk to our national security, then the decision of the court is the right one. Stuart, you're nodding along there. You agree? Yeah, I think in principle that's obviously right. I'm sure the uh, Immigration uh, Appeals uh, Court uh, took the correct decision on the point of law. But I would personally say, uh, had she been well, suspected of committing a crime, she should have been brought back, arrested, charged, put on trial, and if convicted, then uh, sent to prison. But the other bit about this, and I say, I'm sure the judges have made the right decision on the point of law, but I'm always very queasy when I see the UK or any other country make somebody stateless. Mm. And, and, and Gary, that was one of the, the main arguments from, from her legal team. Uh, and shouldn't the UK be responsible for its own citizens, no matter what they've done? Well, I think the uh, Sajid Javid at the time and the government since have made the right calls on this. Uh, and I think that the courts have upheld those decisions which have been made over the last couple of years. And I think that the government deserves to be congratulated on what it's done over the last couple of years protecting this country. Stephen, I, I, there was one commentator today who pointed out, you know, that if, if she has been groomed, and that was something certainly that the court said that, that was evidence that, that was compelling and, and, and that... They, they were looking at it as, as being very finely balanced, really, that it was, certainly wasn't a black or white issue. Um, comparisons have been made by, by young women who are groomed perhaps in places like Rotherham. Do, do you think there would have been a different decision if Shamim Began had been white? Well, it's impossible to speculate. Um, I think, you know, the courts have looked at this in detail. We have a, a political system and a judicial system which is based on the separation of powers. And that's absolutely right. And, the, and this decision was handed to the courts. We can't then try to unpick and criticise the decision of the courts because it's been made on the basis of points of law and an assessment of uh, security and, and Shemima Begum's uh, citizenship status. So I think we now have to accept the decision of the court and we have to learn lessons uh, from this whole case. And, and of course, if there is evidence of grooming, uh, then that needs to be looked at very, very carefully indeed. And the uh, correct action needs to be taken so that this sort of thing can't happen again. Uh, let's move back up to politics here um, and the SNP leadership ba mm. battle, uh, Stuart. It's already been quite an interesting week. You, you've uh, backed Hum Humza Yousaf. Yes. Um, what, what do you make of the discourse this week? There's been a, a great deal of attention around Kate Forbes and, and her faith. Do you think it's, it's possible to have strong faith and high political office? Yes, it absolutely is. And, and I'm sure all the politicians will know in their own parties, uh, colleagues from all faiths and none. And that doesn't debar anyone from holding office or seeking very high office. I think the issue here is, if someone does have profound religious convictions and they're perfectly entitled to them, if those convictions come up against the prevailing social policy of a party or a government, I don't think anyone should expect them not to be questioned. Uh, and that's what's happening. Uh, I do suspect over the next few days this will settle down and the debate will widen into the economy, into other social measures, into how we get independence. Um, so I'll also let you into a secret, and again, I'm sure my colleagues will recognise this, when any long-standing, credible and popular leader goes, of course it can be unsettling for a party. I think that goes without saying. Stephen, do, do you think part of the issue is that 
that the SNP and I suppose we think back to Tim Farron and the Lib Dems are quite liberal parties and that perhaps if, if a party, if it wasn't such a liberal party, it might be more um, easy perhaps for Kate Forbes. Do you think she's getting quite a lot of attention? People are perfectly entitled to hold religious views and hold them strongly and deeply. And, you know, I respect Kate Forbes for coming out and being honest about her position. I profoundly disagree with the position that she takes. Um, I, I believe that we should uh, live and let live and, um, and that that is a really important part, I think, of uh, the liberal uh, culture in, in which we live. And, and I, you know, that's my personal view. I, I would no, never be able to agree with the, the views that she is but setting she, forward. And there is a real clash between the political position of her party and her personal views. And I do think there's clearly a tension then. How, can you really have a leader of a party who is so clearly swimming against the tide of the views of her own party. But watching her interview with Sky News yesterday, I would say that, that she would also say that she is very much live and let live and that, that she, she takes her religion as something that, that is, uh, pertains to her, but she doesn't judge her friends and she doesn't judge her family. So why would she judge the wider Scottish people for having a different view from her? Yeah, but I think you also need to have legislation which facilitates the ability to live and let live and gives people a level playing field where there are not value judgments made on the basis of their sexual orientation, for example. So um, as a politician, you're responsible for bringing forward the right laws and the right policies to ensure that we live in an inclusive uh, and um, welcoming society. And that's where I think, you know, my, my views would diverge from hers. Okay. Let's bring in Gary Sandbrook. Gary, mm -hmm. uh, you're marking the fact that it's Ash Wednesday yeah, today so. very, very clearly. I mean, did, did, what reaction have you had to that today? And, and has that led you to think a little bit differently about, about the whole debate about the SNP? Oh, I do disagree quite a lot with what Kate Forbes has said. I mean, I, I'm a gay man, I'm a gay Christian, so I will obviously support gay marriage. Uh, I very much hope to marry one day. Um, but I think it's very brave of her to speak so openly and honest about her faith, uh, etc. And I think it's very important that politicians should be able to do that. Uh, I don't think what Stephen said is right about suing against the tide, etc. and not being able to be in a position of leadership. Angela Merkel um, showed that you can do just that uh, in Germany. Uh, and I think, um, you know, I, I think it's as... Um, Stuart said, obviously, these things should be questioned. Uh, we should be right that these views are questioned. But I think some of the stuff that you see online and the way in which people have been behaving about it has been uh, really, really distasteful. And I think if we are going to continue to be an open, liberal country, which values um, all the diversity we have in the UK, uh, religious freedom is one of those tenets. Uh, and I think that is very important that we should try and protect too. OK, uh, let's bring on political editor Beth Rigby, who snuck in. Uh, and, and Beth, you know, we're expecting Shamima Began may well be, be raised at Prime Minister's questions, but also what's happening with Northern Ireland. Yeah, of course. And if you think about difficult PMQs for the Prime Minister, they've tended to be around politics and individuals, be that issues around Suala Braverman or Dominic Raab or Nadim Zahawi or Gavin Williamson. Some have left his cabinet, some still in them. But this is a real policy issue today. But there's so much politics mm. around it. And I imagine that Labour will uh, go in on issues around this Brexit deal that is under intense discussions uh, both here and in Brussels as well as in Northern Ireland. Uh, we'll be watching to see what do some of his backbenchers do, some of the ERG, the Eurosceptic uh, group, the Brexiteer group uh, in the party. Do they make any uh, remarks or questions toward the PM? What does the DUP do? Because I have to say, uh, at the end of last week, when it was recess, it was all a go-go on this deal and, and an expectation put out really by number 10 that this could happen early this week. Now, since then, the mood has soured quite a lot with the Brexiteers I speak to. One of them said to me last night, you can't bulldoze a, a deal through, you have to pitch roll, but they're trying to bulldoze us. We need to see the text. We're not going to agree to anything and critically the DUP have to be on board uh, and now it seems that there's some rowback from number 10 with potentially this deal isn't going to happen this week and, and, and from people I've spoken to the handling of it by number 10 if anything has made it harder for the Prime Minister now to get a deal with the backbenchers so I'm looking out for key Brexiteers to see uh, what they say and whether they uh, create problems for the PM today. It might be, might be one of these PMQs where it's not so much the exchange between Keir Starmer mm. and Rishi Sunak but actually what the other questions and the backbenchers say. Uh, Beth thank you very much and thank you very much too to Gary Sandbrook, Conservative MP, Stephen Kinnock for Labour and Stuart Hosey for the SNP for giving us your thoughts ahead of Prime Minister's questions. Uh, we're going to take a very short break but we will return